Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. On each show, we sit down with a Santa Barbara leader who's wrestling with tough issues facing our community to talk about their jobs and their decisions, and to invite them to share their deepest and darkest secrets with the promise we won't tell anybody. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, and joining me in the conversation is Kelsey Brueger, staff writer for The Independent. And our guest tonight is Monique Limon, Santa Barbara School Board trustee and now candidate for the 37th District State Assembly uh, Assembly seat, sorry. Yes. Monique, thank, thank you very you for much for coming. Uh, we want to talk to you about schools and your campaign, but I want to start with just a couple questions about your personal background. Born and raised in Santa Barbara, yes. Santa Barbara High School, uh, senior class president and flag person, what are they, flag girl? Drill I don't, team. Drill, drill team, team, okay. <laughs> UC Berkeley, Columbia University Teachers College. You work at UCSB, elected to the school board 2010, re-elected 2014, and now running for the state assembly. That's right. What neighborhood did you grow up in? Both the west side and the east side. So I started off on the west side. I attended Harding School, and then I transitioned over to the east side and went to Cleveland School. You have siblings? I do. I have a younger brother. He lives in L.A. He's married with two kids. He's also an educator. He works at UCLA um, in the Office for Students with Disabilities, and his wife is a music teacher. So you're the oldest. I am. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, that explains <laughs> a lot. Wait, so how old are you? I'm 35. 35? Mm -hmm. What did your parents do, or what do they do? My parents. So my father um, works at the Four Seasons Biltmore. He's a room service waiter there, and he's been there for 40 years. Really? Yeah. So he's been through transitions. It wasn't always a Four Seasons. Um, and uh, he's also huge on gardens, so he loves plants. So he spends, any times he's not there, he's working with plants. And my mom works at Pacifica Graduate Institute and she provides administrative support um, to uh, the school. Yeah, there. So here's the real question. Mm -hmm. Why don't you use the name Sonia? Sonia. This is a great question. So uh, <laughs> mom picked the name Monique that she heard from a, a novella, soap opera. And dad picked the name Sonia. So when all you know was said and done, Monique Sonia Limon didn't sound as good as Sonia Monique Limon. And mom won. But everyone, the initial, everyone. That's kind of classy. S Monique. S Monique. So the reason I added the initial was because when I decided to run for school board in 2010, I didn't want people to think Sonia and Monique were two different people, but everybody in town knows me as Monique, so I added the S. Very. That's the reason. Very classy. You have a large extended family in Huge, Santa Barbara. Big family. Big Limon and Gill family. I'm the eldest um, on the Gill of the cousins first to go to college. You're so. the eldest of how many yeah. cousins, like 38 oh, or yeah. something? On the Gills? Yeah. Yeah, on the Gills we're about 22, 23. Um, on the Limones we're big. We're, we have about 30, but they're not all here. Uh, um, so. Big shout out to Raul, Uncle Raul, my hero. <laughs> um, so you were a scholarship kid? I was. I was uh, v very fortunate that I was um, a Santa Barbara Scholarship Foundation recipient for all four years. Uh, in college and also for um, my graduate program, for my master's program. So I think it's a great organization. I connected with the individuals there um, and uh, Colette Hadley who just left um, and Billy Mons were just great people, so supportive of me. Um, so I, I have- And you always yeah. wanted to go to Berkeley? <laughs> <laughs> well, the story with Berkeley is, uh, I did, you know, that's where an aunt and uncle went to school. And so, because they went to school there, I had heard of it, and it was a school that was different than UCSB, Westmont, and Santa Barbara City College, which were actually the schools that I was most exposed to, um, being a local. So Berkeley was where, yeah, I said that I wanted to go, and I worked hard, and I was able to do that. And then Columbia? You, uh... And then Columbia, which I had never heard of um, until when I got to Berkeley, not before. So um, yeah, and Columbia was definitely based on my professional interest, which was education and looked for the right match, the right graduate program. And that was um, on the top of my list. How long did you live in New York? I just lived there for about a year. So it was a one year program um, in New York and I got to do all seasons and it was a great place to be. And you need, but you didn't want to stay in New York. It's not Santa Barbara. It's not home. See, that's okay. what happens. You go to the Bay Area, you come back and you work for a little while. You want to come home and then you go to New York and you come back. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the hard-hitting question. What is the <laughs> ha 
you know cheer. So, what is that? <laughs> so it's not ha, it's H-A-U, and it's an organization called Hermanas Unidas. So this was an organization that I was a part of um, when I was in college. It's a student-run um, group, and um, the H-A-U cheer is something um, that uh, we just started. We were really proud to be a group of Latinas at Berkeley, and so we were like, how do we just do something and make ourselves known? And so we started this cheer, and never in my wildest dreams did I think that by, okay, trying to organize a group and, you know, make it rhyme, that I was, um, it was going to be something that was said and used. That organization started at Berkeley with a handful of members. It is now at 19 campuses in California, and there are thousands of members and, and I'm and, and I would have been maybe the, a little they bit they all do the HA they do could they you do. do it could you do it for I me? could Please. so someone will say hey ladies and what you say is the response that people say will be H A U no and they kind of say it with a little more umph there's a nice exclamation point at the end H A U I don't get it no you get it like you know have you heard of like people say you know all right. Maybe not. Kelsey and I, are gonna say, we're going to say, hey, ladies, and yeah. you do. Oh. Hey, ladies. H-A-U, no. And what That's do we it. say? That's it. It's, d it's done. So this, again, had I known that thousands of, like, college students would be saying this, I probably would have made it even more creative. I was just thinking of a way to organize ourselves to be proud of the organization we represented. Little little known facts about Little money. known, you, yeah. You can, you can look it up. Yeah. All right, Kelsey, save me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Monique and I met um, when I was covering the school board. And um, for, for a couple of years, I guess you had been on the school board for a couple of years by that point. Um, and, you know, I guess one thing that I wanted to ask you about is not something that came up a lot during the meetings, but something that I've always kind of been interested in, and that is private fundraising mm -hmm. um, on public schools. And we may have spoken about this in the past. Um, you know, w for instance, the, the first school that comes to mind is I know Peabody has a very robust um, uh, group or, uh, you know, it's like a, maybe it's not necessarily the PTA, but it's a, a group of parents who, um, you know, have jogathons and they're able to raise a half million dollars a year. Um, and, and, and how that's different on different campuses. I mean, I know that, for instance, at Franklin, I've, I've spoken to the principal there, they also have a lot um, going on after schools. They have, you know, bake sales, popcorn sales, um, all, all kinds of kind of after school evening activities, but, you know, they're not bringing in a half million dollars a year. You know, the average parent income is just right. not mm -hmm. the same as at Peabody. And um, I know that, you know, the state does kick in extra money for, for schools um, to kind of level the playing field, but I mean, the question in my mind still is, is that enough? Um, you know, should more be done? What, what can be done? Um, so, Especially in a town like Santa Barbara, right. I imagine the discrepancy is huge. Right. And so I think, you know, to answer your question, is it enough? No. I think that if it was enough, you wouldn't see groups, whether they were large groups or small groups, trying to do additional fundraising. Um, and this is something actually that we've, we've thought about um, a as a community. I don't know if the school board necessarily has tackled it, but I know that there's been community conversations about the role of foundations in education. Um, the Santa Barbara Education Foundation had a speaker that talked about that um, from Stanford University. And I think that um, the need is there at all of our schools. I mean, that's, that's there and there's different needs. And what we try to do as a school board though, is really think about how how do we make sure that um, the experiences that students have uh, may not be identical, but somehow parallel? And so that's where we have conversations about what does that mean? So when there is a school, perhaps, that d d you know has the half a million in fundraising, well, what does that mean? What kind of experiences are those students getting? And how do we as a school board also make sure that other schools um, and other students don't fall short of having those experiences? You're right in the sense that um, there are f there are stu funds for um, students who are uh, coming from a low income um, background, who are English learners, um, uh, now foster youth and so forth. but. In the end, all those additional extra funds, they're not necessarily enough to do what it is we want to do. And when we 
created our strategic plan as a school district, we actually asked that question. What is it that we want our students to get out of our schooling experience? And so when people said arts, when people said, um, you know, we want them to have some level of technology in there, we really listened to that and we said, all right, well, now it's our role um, to, to think about how we can provide that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, you know, you mentioned English language learners, and that was kind of something else that you know I've um, sat through meetings when when that has come up. Um, and I guess for for me, the the piece that was um, most interesting in that conversation was how many students in the district have had um, that label for five years, six years. And, English and language learners. English language learners, right? And um, at the time, I know the number was a little bit more than 500, um, and I think maybe that was about a year ago, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit longer. And I wonder, is you know, what what has the school district done? And is um, is that appropriate? I mean, is that um, to, to have a student in you know as an ELL for, for more for than so five years? Mm -hmm. So we th yes. Yeah, so the term we is use that is the long metric that you. Well, well they, there's actually a classification. It's long-term English um, language learners, and that's five or more years. And so is that, um, you, you know, I have an issue with that, and I think I've actually raised it multiple times um, on the school board. Wait a minute. So what does that mean? That means so that, that after means that five years you're not, you haven't No, met. so th what this means is that for five years, students have been in the English language learner classification, which means they've been going through a series of interventions, of programs that are specific to helping them master um, the English language and literacy and you know on all levels so that they can move forward um, and have a traditional uh, educational path. So the concern is that five years is a long time. Um, and what other people don't know is that a lot of the students that are classified as English learners are actually students that were born here. Um, and so that's another piece. I think there's a misconception that people think, oh, every English language learner comes to us from a different country. Well, that's not necessarily a case. It's based on whatever parents indicate when they enroll their child in the district. Were you? Now you were. I was, yes. And they, so- When you enrolled in school? Right, so what happens is that every parent has to indicate what's the primary language spoken at home. It's the family language survey, and they will write it. And so I've had parents, um, graduates of Berkeley and Stanford, um, who say, I, we were so proud that it was a bilingual home, and we wrote that. And then they find out that their student, their son or daughter is an English language learner, and they go, but wait, 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 what's going on? We were just really proud, we were really excited. Um, and so in some cases, yes, that is the primary language spoken at home. And so that means that they um, that the students who are classified as English learners will get certain support services to help them transition. But in my case, when I was classified as an English language learner, um, I was part the, the support service or the intervention was pulling me out of the classroom for certain parts of the day to have my own kind of not by myself, but like a small group of students um, learn. Uh, it was primary, I think, reading and writing um, in, a d in a different language. It was kind of bilingual. Um, and so the argument is sometimes made, well, why does this exist? And why are some students who you know, are here who understand English get put in this particular program? So it's a big deal. It's, I, I think it's a challenge. I think it's a problem. The numbers um, that you cited are correct. The, you know, that many students have been in the school district in that program for more than five years, and that's a concern. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about that. Um, but I also know that just you know a few years ago, and um, we gave a report um, about this, gosh, if it wasn't the last meeting, it was you know two meetings ago that um, when you know or when our superintendent started, he quoted that there were five students who had been reclassified. And now we're at over a thousand students who um, were reclassified and reclassified. Me, That's reclassified a good thing. Me. That's a good thing. We want that. We want that reclassification, and we want students to be reclassified in their younger years if they're ready. There will be students for different reasons who might stay mm -hmm. as English learners for a little bit longer, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's not. 600. Right. They shouldn't be 600. Well, and I also wonder, I mean, mm -hmm. when students get to that high school level, you know, I mean, how does that impact um, their their experience? I mean, I think when I was covering it, the, the tricky thing was explaining to people what does this really mean? You know, you right. say, you're like, oh, this ELL label, like, okay, so what? You know, and you think about it from a perspective of a high school kid, you know, how how is their day-to-day -day changed? You know, are they taken out of electives classes because they're in ELL classes? What, you know, what kind of kind of 
stigmas associated with that, you know, in high school of, of all places. Yeah, well, and I think it impacts them two ways. Academically, because they're not able to take classes that prepare them to go into the university because they're still doing these support programs, these interventions um, to learn or master English, um, but then socially. I think that there's an impact. And so the students who are English language learners that get to the high school can't take the same college level UC A through G path because they just don't have, one of their classes is gonna have to be an intervention program of sorts. And then I think I see it socially too, um, as far as they're not always the students who are engaged with athletics, with you know theater, music, any performing arts. Um, and there's, of course, exceptions to the rules. But yes, and this is why it's been a big deal for our district. We want our students to master that so that they can also, so it doesn't in any way impa negatively impact the opportunities they may have post leaving our district. What yeah. is the achievement gap and how does that relate to, to what you're talking about The now? achievement gap. So the achievement gap is, I think, you know, we speak of it a little bit more broadly and it is about the academic um, achievement of students and the gap between seeing students who, and you, you can divide it up, by the way, in any direction. So you can look at ethnicity, so you can look at Latino students versus white students, but you can also look at income. So students who are socio, uh, socio, socioeconomic disadvantaged to students who may not fit that criteria. And in both cases, you see a big gap. Here's how these students are doing academically. So whether we measure that with grades or with percentage of students who go to college or percentage of students who graduate from high school um, to students who don't you know, to the other side, right? So whether that other side is students who are, don't come from, you know, a, a, a working class family or um, of sorts. So that's what we just, that's what and we that's talk about. And that's what a lot of reforms in recent years have been mm -hmm. aimed at, none of which have worked, right? Right, so a lot of reforms have been aimed at trying to make sure that all of our students are successful in achievement. Um, and you know, there's a lot of kind of uh, reasons. So some of the reasons, of course, I think are moral reasons. Like, of course, we want every student to have that opportunity. Um, but there's arguments too about the you know, economic reasons, about what happens when you have uh, you know, an undereducated um, community, and that makes up the majority. So they don't vote at the same rate, and when they don't vote at the same rate you see you know higher health problems um, you know there's all kinds of other issues that come up so different arguments are made as to why we need to focus on that but in the end we're talking about the same thing you can break it down in different groups but it's some groups that you know are achieving and other groups that are not and I want to be clear that it's never about not helping students achieve more it's about making sure when we talk about the achievement gap that the students who are underachieving can get up to that level so I don't think it compromises those students who are actually um, you know doing great we want to keep that up and we want to continue to provide opportunities but we have to have a conversation about the students that aren't there yet ultimately isn't that about poverty I, I think so. I think poverty has a lot to do with it, yes. Um, and one of the things that we've done on the school board is when we started looking at data, sometimes it was just ethnicity data. And, you know, talking about ethnicity and, you know, achievement gap can be hard. You know, people don't always know how to react to it and think about it. So one of the things we did is we started saying, well, let's look at free and reduced lunch, which is kind of what translates for us as po to poverty, right? The students who, um, you know, come from families who, who need assistance. And when you look at the achievement gap with for poverty as opposed to ethnicity, it's bigger. So it's a bigger problem, it's worse. And that's something that um, is a big problem. And we, and we see that and we, we have to have that discussion. Yeah. yeah. Do you see, uh, do you see when, you know, when, I, I remember just filling out, um, when students are filling out that form for free and reduced lunch, that that's kind of um, an issue that, you know, students are maybe embarrassed to do so. And as a school district, you know, how much are you encouraging people to do that and sort of getting in their face and saying, fill out this form? Like, where's the line there? Yeah, so I think... Um, the stigma probably comes a little bit more at the junior high and high school level than the elementary school level, um, because in the elementary school level, you have kind of this very uniform process. Everyone just goes to the cafeteria and eats their food or brings it from home or what have you. Um, but at the secondary level, you start to see it, right? Students have different food options, um, especially at our high schools. They can leave um, our campus for food. And if you are basically a student who qualifies for free and reduced lunch, what your ticket or what your 
you know, I'll call it ticket, buys you is something that's on campus. So there are social stigmas. And so one of the things that I think has been creative that we've done is we've brought these um, food trucks to all of our high school campuses. And they may sound silly, but they're popular. They have good food, it's popular, there's lines, and they take the food, so these are just Oh, they food take the uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it doesn't completely solve the problem um, you know, as far as the social stigma that's associated with it, but um, for us, the reason we ask students and families to fill out is because we really want to understand, we want to get a true assessment of who is in our district. And it helps us know, well, hey, this is the level of poverty that we have. Um, and we've been, you know, there's been also great programs too, um, not just district wide, but city wide, county wide, um, you know, private foundations that have come to do good work around food um, and food access in our community. All right, let's talk about politics for All a little right. bit. Um, <laughs> now, you got elected, re elected to the school board less than a year ago. 2014. Yeah, so <laughs> how, I mean, presumably you went around, you told voters, yeah, I'm running for the school board, it's what I really want to do. Uh, how concerned are you that people are going to feel you weren't being straight with them about that? Well, I, I actually, I'm not terribly concerned, to be honest with you. I feel that it got first got elected in 2010, back on in 2014, and um, my commitment to the schools has not at any point changed, and to our community hasn't changed. I think with my role in running for state assembly, it's extending that commitment to the schools. But you didn't say schools. when you were out there, well, you know, Dawson's going to be termed know. out, so maybe I'm not. In all I'm fairness, gonna... I also didn't know. Um, so, I mean, well, you knew he was going to be termed out. I knew, but I'd, I wasn't clear that I, I at that time, that I would be running for his seat. So that's something that um, when I started on the school board, it, you know, I didn't, the, the public office path was kind of fuzzy to me. I didn't really know what it was going to look like. And I didn't necessarily know how I was going to do. I had never been in public office. I had never had friends in public office. I had never had um, family members um, in public office. So I think it was through that process that I thought, gosh, you know, it's, it was the, the work on the school board that started my, my really lobbying to our state senator and our state assembly member on education issues. I brought them over to the campuses to see the work, and that's led me to this run for state assembly. Now, with the new term limits, uh, you can be in the assembly for 12 years. That's right. Nobody's running against you at the moment. At this it, moment, yes. At this yes. moment. <laughs> well, this show goes on forever. Don't worry about it. Um, so 12 years, so, so now will you, will you now say here tonight that you'll, you'll stay put in the assembly for 12 years? Oh or? my goodness. I don't know that I, I can make that commitment. I think one of the things, you know. But, <laughs> Nobody but, will remember right? it, so. No, no, but, the, but part of it is, you know, I think that there's um, a lot of factors that influence one's decision into what you do in life. And I feel that there's always been, and I've always been very clear that in my life, one thing cannot be the ultimate thing that makes me happy. So whether that's public office or higher ed. And so for me, the decision to run for state assembly was a really thoughtful one in trying to understand who might be in line. Is it gonna, was it gonna be someone who perhaps had shared some of the similar values and could represent this district in a way that I thought, gosh, I'm so excited to you know go behind this particular account candidate. Um, but there was also a lot of personal reflection of do I leave higher ed? My professional background, my graduate you know, work, my research um, has been in higher ed. And I feel like I've done meaningful work there that makes me happy. And so thinking about the possibility of trading work that you enjoy doing, trading a career for, you know, to take in a di different direction was not easy. So you're, so you're not going to stay at UCSB if you're elected? Can't. If elected, oh, that's right. yeah, you can. yeah, it's, it's a, a full-time job. Well, yeah, it's a full-time well, full job. job. Yeah, but you get a um, car. I mean, yeah, you <laughs> get a car, right. and you know, make those wonderful six to seven-hour drives uh, back and forth. No, and that's that's hard, and that's hard. I mean, that was hard, but I also, what's important to me, and, and this is why I can't answer your question about what will happen. Will I be there twelve years, less, more? Well, you can't be there more, but will something else come up? Is because it's also about the level of impact that I have. At UCSB, I believe I continue to have impact in the work that I do. I believe I have impact on the school board. On the assembly, I believe that I'm gonna have impact. But if there is a moment there that is where I feel like, you know what, I don't know, maybe, you know, then then I, I have to be okay with saying maybe somebody else. So basically, or you're, next. basically you're running for governor. 
Is that uh, what you're saying? Well, you never know. <laughs> All right, I want to ask you about the most expensive free lunch you ever got. Okay. Oh, you, yeah. You were fined $200 by I the was. Fair Political mm -hmm. Practices Commission for $146.06 worth yes. of free meals. A meal at Stingery, whatever that? that. What is that? <laughs> and a dinner at Donovan's. What's tell us? Right. Tell us a story about that. So, so in my first twelve months, right in public office, um, I had some colleagues from school boards, um, in different you know, in different parts of the state, had said, "Oh, you know, we went to a conference and we have these evening you know receptions that you can go to." And I'm like, "Well, I already had dinner. I'm not sure that I should go." Um, because yeah, but they were like, no, this is a really good networking opportunity. You'll meet other school board members. So I went without even thinking twice. I wasn't actually um, an official guest per se. I just kind of joined to network to meet other people, not knowing that that alone was enough to be like, you need to report it. So I made that mistake um, in my first 12 months. I corrected it, and that's where that fine comes from. And apparently from. you weren't the only one because no, there, there were, were like dozens right, of people. Right, yeah. Same, same there, 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 yeah, um, for the same thing. But, you know, and, and I think it's part of it. I, I definitely think that if you think of my, if I, I think of my background, it's not all... Um, you know, some sometimes the experiences we have and the the mistakes we make are those that help us do it better and saying, okay, wait, now I know better. You should see my last FPPC reporting and the number of emails that I said to make sure. I was like, I just want to be clear that I'm filing correctly. Um, you know, and I would send emails to the FPPC. What did you What did you eat at Stingery? You know what? I don't actually think I had a serious meal. <laughs> so, but it doesn't matter. She I was pretending you know, she doesn't know. No, I, I I don't know what Stingery is. It's like, you know, it's just, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know that. It, yeah, but um, but again, I, I think the point is is just that you know we all are responsible and have to follow rules. And if you make a mistake, then you own up to it, and that's it. I, mm -hmm. Uh, do you support the death with dignity legislation? Would you have voted for that in Sacramento? Yes. And, um, you know, one of the reasons um, that I, I support it is uh, my grandmother passed away from pancreatic cancer years ago. And the last two weeks of her life, um, it was family members around her watching um, her body physically deteriorate. And um, I just think that... Uh, there comes a point where people, I mean, are going down the path of really, it is the end. And I'm not sure anything could have, ch you know, changed at that point. It's just two weeks of watching a body shut down. And it's very physical. It's very hard. It's very painful. And so, um, you know, and I think it's a choice pe people could make. People make the choice um, now to, um, you know, go on life support, it, it, you know? And, and so I think that that's something that people can make. Yeah. All right, well, Monique Limon, thank you so much oh, for joining us. Great. It went so fast, and we're gonna have to have you back. That's what happens when you're having fun. 13 yeah. or 14 times. Mm -hmm. Kelsey, thank you so much for being thank with you. us. And thank you for watching uh, Newsmakers. Uh, we'll be back uh, with a new show in two weeks, and uh, it'll, it'll be a surprise guest because I have no idea who it'll be, but watch our Facebook page for it. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Good night. Yeah. How, many, how many questions have we been laboring over?